Cancer and Biochemistry 15. Hello, it's November 7, 2018, and I'm Dr. Colleen Huber, here again today in the latest installment of my Cancer and Biochemistry video series. It is now way overdue for me to pay attention to the scientist whose work was so fundamental to my work and others who work in metabolic treatments for cancer, Dr. Otto Warburg, who lived from 1883 to 1970. Otto Warburg was a doctor of chemistry from Berlin and a doctor of medicine from Heidelberg. Otto Warburg was the leading biochemist of his time. Dr. Warburg was never a teacher and was not widely known public speaking. Um, he expressed gratitude throughout his life for being able to devote his life's work to scientific research. From 1931 on, Warburg was director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Cell Physiology in Berlin. While there, he made key discoveries regarding cellular respiration and cellular metabolism, which gave the best understanding yet of the chemical equivalent of yin and yang, that is, oxidation and reduction reactions that pertain throughout the biological world. In 1931, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Warburg for his work in this field. Dr. Warburg's legacy has endured with most renown regarding his work with the metabolism of cancerous tumors. He is often misquoted as suggesting that cancer cannot metabolize or cannot exist in an oxygen-deprived environment. This statement would make the defeat of cancer considerably easier than such work actually is. However, that is not what Dr. Warburg found. What Warburg found was that a low oxygen environment, as well as a low acidic pH, is characteristic of cancer. He also discovered that cancer is distinct from normal tissue most fundamentally in this respect. At some point, an injury may occur to normal cells that causes those cells to change the way that they make energy, called cellular respiration. That change stops cancer cells from using oxygen and to switch to using fermentation of sugar in order to produce their energy. Let me now show what I showed in previous videos in this series. That fermentation of sugar is a path that goes off this way, to your right. Dr. Warburg described the progression of events leading to cancer in this succinct way. There are a great many remote causes of cancer, but there is only one common cause into which all other causes of cancer merge, the irreversible injuring of respiration. Warburg implicated environmental toxins, radiation, etc., as the prime causes of cancer. This, in turn, reduces available oxygen to certain cells. When those cells are deprived of oxygen, in order to continue living, they must find a different way to produce energy. If there is also sufficient sugar in the system to enable this, those cells will begin to ferment sugar in order to continue to metabolize and thrive. In other words, sugar becomes the main fuel of cancer. But that requires that there is enough sugar on hand to actually feed cancer. So then, in a nutshell, we have the main causes of cancer as being in this order of events. Number one, exposure to toxins or radiation, which leads to, number two, lack of oxygen, plus three, the presence of sugar, which both together lead to four, a shift of metabolism away from normal metabolism here and toward this pathway here, the fermentation of sugar. Please see my other videos in this series, particularly the first four videos at this link. The problem of exposure to toxins is likely worse when it occurs over a prolonged period of time. The risk for cancer then increases if the individual does not exercise and therefore has less than optimal oxygen at the cellular level. A further risk is nutrient deficiency, which deprives the mitochondria of the necessary resources to metabolize and creates obstacles to normal, healthy mitochondrial metabolism, creating obstacles through this pathway. A common misconception about cancer is that genetics are decisive. This is false and has been proven false. Genetics are of far less importance in cancer risk than the above risk factors. How do we know this? A simple experiment has now been replicated in a number of laboratories internationally. We know that the genetic machinery of the cell is in the nucleus and that the part of the cell outside the nucleus, called the cytoplasm, is not generally involved with cell reproduction. So here's why genetics actually don't matter very much in cancer. Despite the massive amount of money going from your insurance premium payments to prop up the cancer genetics industry, 
plus the huge donations raised during Pink Ribbon Time to look for a genetic-based treatment. Here is why. Despite the fact that your family has donated massive amounts in the form of insurance premium payments, here is why the genetic component of cancer is not important. When the nucleus of a cancer cell was transferred to the cytoplasm of a normal cell, the cell stayed normal. So the cytoplasm, that is the non-genetic part, was decisive in the fate of the cell. On the other hand, when the nucleus of a normal cell was transferred into the cytoplasm of a cancer cell, the cell stayed cancerous. So here again, the nucleus, the genetic machinery, did not determine the fate of the cell. It was the cytoplasm again that was decisive. What a horrible mistake it was to blame the genetic machinery for cancer. So many lives lost through deadly and ineffective treatments. Quickly mutating cancer cells made one chemo drug stop working after another. So much poison killing the person instead of the cancer and on and on for so many years. So much money and pink ribbons thrown away on poor medicine and very weak science. Genetics are not only not decisive in cancer, genetics vary from tumor to tumor even in the same person. Even more amazingly, a biopsy from one part of a tumor will tell a different story about genes than a biopsy from a different part of the same tumor in the same person. Yet, conventional medicine adheres to the dogma of somatic mutation theory, as they call this, like gum to the shoe. Although the somatic mutation theory has been the most expensive and most deadly mistake historically with regard to cancer, it is not the only human mistake about cancer. Historically, people have blamed cancer on many microbes, fungi, bacteria, viruses, etc. However, our species has lived with those creatures since pre-recorded history, while cancer was nearly unheard of, a vanishingly rare disease. What is new and different, yet correlates very closely with cancer incidence, is simply pollution and bad food. In recent centuries, humans have created an ever larger and more concentrated stew of toxins in which we live. Cancer incidence is especially high in areas of high concentration of toxins. Environmental pollutants are such a ubiquitous problem that blood tests on even newborn infants have found hundreds of toxins tested. Since the beginning of the industrial age, over 100,000 synthetic chemicals have been produced and released into our environment. Those toxins are not able to be fully metabolized in the liver, which leaves many of them to cause ongoing havoc in the body, creating an ongoing internal cancer risk. So what are the best ways to prevent cancer? Dr. Warburg illustrated the path that all cancer takes as long ago as 1931. Although conventional medicine found it far more profitable to ignore Dr. Warburg's findings, those truths have not been disproven. Dr. Warburg's conclusions have only been verified over time, confirmed and reproven throughout the world in the years since his Nobel awarded work. To avoid entering that cancer pathway over here, we have to look at what we need to do in order to detour away from that path. In this order, I recommend the following. Number one, avoid toxins and radiation to the best of your ability. This involves choosing organic food when possible, avoiding use of insecticides and herbicides, and artificial air fresheners and synthetic cleansers around your home and your family. Avoiding radiation exposure, choosing RO or spring water when available. Number two, exercise daily. Exercise is the best method I know to bring oxygen into the body. Exercise is not the exclusive realm of athletes, nor of those wealthy enough to afford a private tennis court. Exercise is an absolute requirement for those of any income level and all ages. Even the homeless and the elderly can afford to and can make time for a walk of a few miles every day. Don't keep telling your doctor that you have a plan to begin exercising. Don't keep telling your doctor that you tried exercise once and it didn't work, so you quit. Those cancer patients who told me that are now dead. Start exercising today, whether you walk today, bike tomorrow, run the next day, and go to the gym on the next day, or any mix of any exercise at all. Start with a half hour of gentle exercise. As you get stronger, increase your time and intensity. Three, nourish yourself with whole natural foods and not too much fruit. If you don't eat organ meats at least once per week, you will possibly need to supplement with at least a B-complex. 
see your local naturopathic physician for specific recommendations related to your health. At primarydoctor.org or at naturopathic.org. Four, always avoid sweetened foods. Stevia is okay, but likely none of the other sweeteners are risk-free. Well, this is what I've learned from Dr. Warburg and later other scientists who stood on his shoulders. In my next video, I would like to discuss the work of the great Thomas Seafried. It is November 7, 2018. I am Dr. Colleen Huber, and thanks for watching.